The Sydney Harbour Bridge is a heritage-listed steel-through arch bridge in Sydney, spanning Sydney Harbour from the central business district to the North Shore. The view of the bridge, the harbour and the nearby Sydney Opera House is widely regarded as an iconic image of Sydney and Australia itself. Nicknamed the Coat Hangar because of its arch-based design, the bridge carries rail, vehicular, bicycle and pedestrian traffic. Under the direction of John Bradfield of the New South Wales Department of Public Works, the bridge was designed and built by British firm Dorman Long of Middlesbrough, who based the design on their 1928 Tyne Bridge in Newcastle-upon-Tyne and opened in 1932. The bridge's general design, which Bradfield tasked the New South Wales Department of Public Works with producing, was a rough copy of the Hellgate Bridge in New York City. This general design document, however, did not form any part of the request for tender. The design chosen from the tender responses was original work designed by Dorman Long, who leveraged some of the design from their own Tyne Bridge, which, though superficially similar, does not share the graceful flares at the ends of each arch, which makes the Harbour Bridge so distinctive. It is the eighth longest spanning arch bridge in the world and the tallest steel arch bridge, measuring 134 meters from top to water level. It is also the world's widest long span bridge at 48.8 meters wide, until construction of the new Portman Bridge in Vancouver was completed in 2012. The Sydney Harbour Bridge went on to be added to the Australian National Heritage List on 19th of March 2007 and to the New South Wales State Heritage Register on 25th of June 1999. There had been plans to build a bridge as early as 1815, when convict and noted architect Francis Greenway repeatedly proposed to Governor Lachlan Macquarie that a bridge be built from the northern to the southern shore of the harbour. In 1825, Greenway wrote a letter to the then, the Australian newspaper stating that a bridge would give an idea of strength and magnificence that would reflect credit and glory on the colony and the mother country. Nothing came of Greenway's suggestions, but the idea remained alive, and many further suggestions were made during the 19th century. In 1840, naval architect Robert Brindley proposed that a long floating bridge be built. Engineer Peter Henderson produced one of the earliest known drawings of a bridge across the harbour around 1857. A suggestion for a truss bridge was made in 1879, and in 1880, a high-level bridge estimated at £850,000 was proposed. In 1900, the Line government committed to building a new central railway station and organised a worldwide competition for the design and construction of a harbour bridge. Local engineer Norman Self submitted a design for a suspension bridge and won the second prize of £500. In 1902, the outcome of the first competition became mired in controversy. Self won a second competition outright, with a design for a steel cantilever bridge. The selection board were unanimous, commenting that the structural lines are correct and true in proportion, and the outline is graceful. However, due to an economic downturn and a change of government at the 1904 New South Wales state election, construction never began. A unique three-span bridge was proposed in 1922 by Ernest Stowe with connections at Balls Head, Millers Point and Balmain with a memorial tower and a hub on Goat Island. In 1914, John Bradfield was appointed Chief Engineer of Sydney Harbour Bridge and Metropolitan Railway Construction, and his work on the project over many years earned him 
the legacy as the father of the bridge. Bradfield's preference at the time was for a cantilever bridge without piers. And in 1916, the New South Wales Legislative Assembly passed a bill for such a construction. However, it did not proceed as the Legislative Council rejected the legislation on the basis that the money would be better spent on the war effort. Following World War I, plans to build a bridge began build momentum. Bradfield persevered with the project, fleshing out the details of the specifications and financing for his cantilever bridge proposal. And in 1921, he traveled overseas to investigate tenders. His confidential secretary, Kathleen M. Butler, handled all the international correspondence during his absence, her title belying her role as a technical advisor. On return from his travels, Bradfield decided that an arch design would also be suitable, and he and the officers of the New South Wales Department of Public Works prepared a general design for a single arch bridge based upon the New York City's Hellgate Bridge. In 1922, the government passed the Sydney Harbour Bridge Act No. 28, specifying that the construction of a high-level cantilever or arch bridge across the harbour between Dole's Point and Milson's Point, along with the construction of necessary approaches and electric railway lines. And worldwide tenders were invited for, for the project. As a result of the tendering process, the government received 20 proposals from six companies. On 24th of March 1924, the contract was awarded to British firm Dorman Long & Co Limited of Middlesbrough as well as the contractors who later built the similar Tyne Bridge of Newcastle upon Tyne for an arch bridge at a quoted price of £4,200,017,721. The arch design was cheaper than an alternative county lever and suspension bridge proposals and also provided greater rigidity, making it better suited for the heavy loads expected. In 1924, Kathleen Butler travelled to London to set up the project office within those of Dorman Long & Co, attending the most difficult and technical questions and technical questions in regard to the contract, and dealing with a mass of correspondence. Bradfield and his staff were ultimately to oversee the bridge design and building process as it was executed by Dorman Long & Co, whose consulting engineer, Sir Rolf Freeman of Sir Douglas Fox and & Partners, and his associated Mr. G.C. Imbolt, carried out the detailed design and erection process of the bridge. Architects for the contractors were from the British firm John Bernay and Partners of Glasgow, Scotland. Lawrence Ennis of Dorman Long served as Director of Construction and Primary On-Site Supervisor throughout the entire build, alongside Edward Judge, Dorman Long's Chief Technical Engineer, who functioned as Consulting and Designing Engineer. The southern end of the bridge is located at Dawes Point in the Rocks area and the northern end at Milsons Point in the lower North Shore area. There are six original lanes of road traffic through the main roadway, plus an additional two lanes of road traffic on its eastern side, using lanes that were formerly tram tracks. Adjacent to the road traffic, a path for pedestrian use runs along the eastern side of the bridge whilst a dedicated path for bicycle use only runs along the western side. Between the main roadway and the western bicycle path lies the North Shore Railway Line. The main roadway across the bridge is known as the Bradfield Highway and is about 2.4 kilometers long, making it one of the shortest highways in Australia. The arch is composed of 28 panel arch trusses 
Their heights vary from 18 meters at the center of the arch to 57 meters that extends to the pylons. At each end of the arch stands a pair of 89 meters high concrete pylons, faced with granite. The pylons were designed by the Scottish architect Thomas S. Tate, a partner in the architectural firm John Benet and Partners. Some 250 Australian, Scottish and Italian stonemasons and their families relocated to a temporary settlement at Maruya, New South Wales, 300 kilometers south of Sydney where they carried around 18,000 meters cube of granite over the bridge pylons. The stonemasons cut, dressed, and numbered the blocks, which were then transported to Sydney on three ships built specifically for this purpose. The Maruya Quarry was managed by John Gilmore, a Scottish stonemason who emigrated with his young family to Australia in 1924 at the request of the project managers. The concrete use was also Australian made and supplied from Candos, New South Wales. Abutment at the base of the pylons are essential to support the loads from the arch and hold its span firmly in place. But the pylons themselves have no structural purpose. They were included to provide a frame for the arch panels and to give better visual balance to the bridge. The pylons were not part of the original design and were only added to allay public concern about structural integrity of the bridge. Although originally added to the bridge solely for their aesthetic value, all four pylons have now been put to use. The southeastern pylon contains a museum and tourist centre, with a 360 degrees lookout at the top providing views across the harbour and city. The southwestern pylon is used by the New South Wales Roads and Traffic Authority to support its CCTV cameras overlooking the bridge and the roads around that area. The two pylons on the North Shore include venting chimneys for fumes from the Sydney Harbour Tunnel, with the base of the southern pylon containing the RMS maintenance shed for the bridge, and the base of the northern pylon containing the traffic management shed for tow trucks and safety vehicles. In 1942, the pylons were modified to include parapets and anti-aircraft guns designed to assist in both Australia's defence and general war effort. The top level of stonework was never removed. The arch has a span of 504 meters and its summit is 134 meters above mean sea level. Expansion of the steel structures on hot days can increase the height of the arch by 18 centimeters. The total weight of the steelwork of the bridge, including the arch and approach spans, is 52,800 tons, with the arch itself weighing 39,000 tons. About 79% of the steel, specifically those technical sections constituting the curve of the arch, was imported pre-formed from England, with the rest being sourced from Newcastle. On site, the contractors, Norman Long and Co, set up two workshops at Milsons Point, at the site of the present-day Lunar Park, and fabricated the steel into girders and other required parts. The bridge is held together by 6 million Australian-made hand-driven rivets supplied by McPherson Company of Melbourne, the last being driven through the deck on 21st of January 1932. The rivets were heated red-hot and inserted into the plates. 
The headless end was immediately rounded over a large pneumatic rivet gun. The largest of the rivets used weighed 3.5 kilograms and was 39.5 centimeters long. The practice of riveting large steel structures rather than welding was, at the time, a proven and understood construction technique. While structural welding had not at that stage been adequately developed for use on the bridge.